So we want to finish up our discussion today of uh, regulation. And uh, if you'll recall, we've talked about a lot of different issues. Uh, today we'll just talk about some problems with uh, regulation of banking. Um, we feel like we've got the, this historical problem and then we found some solutions to it. Uh, the big solution that's had so much success, or I guess we should say two of them, was um, uh, number one, uh, FDIC insurance coverage. It would make people comfortable and not worried about, oh, is my bank going to fail? And once they're comfortable with the safety of their deposits, they don't get panicky, they don't run to the bank, and then we don't have the panic that spreads across the country. And the other thing that we feel like has been uh, pretty successful is bank regulation. Uh, requiring banks to have capital and uh, limiting the risk they can take and so forth. So anyway, let's talk about some problems with that. And first of all, we'll talk about FDIC. Okay. Um, we've already used this term before, and so you'll know what that means. We have moral hazard problems that are created as a result of the FDIC. Okay, Let's just think for a second what life would be like without deposit insurance. If there's a bank over here and you've got some money, let's say you've got $1,000 or five dollars or $10,000, and you're thinking about, oh, should I put my, I don't know, $10,000 in the bank? Would you just give a bank 10000 bucks, no deposit insurance? Or would you start saying, gosh, I'm a little nervous about that. I mean, I'd like to have the convenience of having a checking account and so forth, and I'd like to get some interest and whatever other services come along with that. But are they going to give my money back? And so when you started thinking about giving it to the bank, there are obviously other banks scattered around town or around the state or around the nation. There's different places you can put it. Then you start thinking about, hmm, how safe is my money going to be? And if somebody comes along and says to you, oh, don't you worry about that. If you put $10,000 in that bank or 20 or 50 or 75 or 100, you put your money in that bank and it fails. You get your money back. Then you say, okay, I'm not worried. And you know that, okay, I'm not worried. That's the feeling we wanted you to have that would prevent you from getting panicky and running on the bank and demanding your cash back at the first sign of bad news. That's a good thing. But right now there's not that issue of the panic and the bank runs and so forth. Right now the issue is, are you putting your money at a well-managed bank? A bank that's taking moderate risk rather than high risk. And if we have deposit insurance, FDIC insurance, then you just say, yeah, I'm not worried. I don't care where it goes. And so, basically, the moral hazard problem is this, is once we say to you, oh, we are insuring you, your deposit, not you as a person, we're insuring your deposit, then you say, oh, okay, now that I'm insured, I am just protected against reckless decisions, bad decisions. So now the tendency is to make bad decisions. Now, you don't seek out the worst bank, but the point is you don't ask for information. What you would ask for is this, hey, how much interest do I get on my deposit? And let's just say, for example, that this is the worst managed bank in town, and they're paying 2% on deposits, and then this one's paying 1.9%, 1 this one's 1.8%, 1 and, uh, and so forth, 1.8%, 1.9%. Then you just say, gosh, I'll tell you what, that 1.9, that's better. I mean, that 2.0%, that's better than 1.9, 1.8. Good enough. I'll do it. So you've been insured and now you make a decision, I'll give it to the bank that pays the most interest. Well, I wonder why that bank can pay the most interest. And the answer is, if everything about its operations are the same as the other banks, it couldn't pay more. If it's paying the same amount of rent as other banks, and if it's lending its money at the same interest rate or you know, extending credit at the same interest rate as other banks, well, then it couldn't pay more. How can it pay more? And the answer is it pays more because when that bank makes loans, it makes risky loans. Riskier than these other banks do. And then these other banks, when they're lending the money, maybe what they're doing is lending at 6% and this bank is lending at 8%.
And so this bank says, hey, we can afford to pay you a little bit more, and they could still afford to pay 3%. And so what I'm saying to you is that once we get FDIC insurance, it takes the burden away from the depositor to protect their money. And let's don't forget that person right there, that depositor, they own that money. And in a, some state of nature, in some unregulated society, all the risk would fall on you. If you go out and hand your money to the wrong person, you pay the penalty. And that penalty that you would pay of losing your money, that is your incentive to make a good decision on who to hand that money to. And now we've taken away that penalty for you to make a bad decision. So, let's say these other banks, these alternatives, are all well-managed banks, and this one is not well-managed. It's taken a lot of risk, maybe kind of reckless decision-making. What we've actually done is this, and I mean in a broader sense. In a, in a narrow sense, what we've done is we've taken away your incentive to be careful. In a broader sense, we've done this. We've caused other people to say, gosh, I'm going to withdraw my money from these other banks, and I'm going to move it into this bank. Why? Extra interest. You'll have people taking their money out. Oh, I'm only getting 1.8%. I'll put it over here where I can get two. And so we start weakening these banks. These banks getting smaller and weaker. And we're building this bank up now. It's bringing the dollars in. And so for, you know, you saw your situation, your incentives taken away. The same thing is true throughout society. And now what's happening is our banking system is getting weaker. What we're doing is we're weakening the best managed banks and we are putting our funds into banks that are not well managed. Hmm. What was our initial goal? Our initial goal was to have a safer banking system. Right? That's where all this deposit insurance came from. We want a safer banking system. We don't want to have situations where there could be a big bank failure causing a Great Depression and so forth. And yet, we've got this situation by taking away incentives for depositors. We've got a situation where we're funneling money to the riskiest banks and creating a situation where, uh-oh, if this bank fails because of all of its risky loan portfolio, not only is it a bank that fails, but it is a big bank that fails. So, I guess what I'm saying to you is that there's sort of this short-run success. We can get you to not think so much about, oh, is my bank failing? I'm going to run to the bank. We can take that risk away, but we've created another kind of risk. And so, that is one problem that we have with the FDIC. Back in the old days, I told you the other day about how the regulators watch and they see these banks that are growing rapidly. They are the ones that are bringing in lots and lots of dollars and making lots and lots of loans. And when you're making lots and lots of loans, you're not being careful at doing that. You're not evaluating those. You're going out there and making loans to lots of people and companies that you otherwise wouldn't. So when we had these really rapidly growing banks, I don't mean to say 3%, 5%, 8%. I mean 50%, 80%, 100% growth. When we see that, then we've got a situation kind of like this. Like, hey, this, any one bank cannot grow at 50% a year unless it's doing something different than the rest of the banking system. Unless they're taking lots of risk and paying a little bit more interest. And by the way, we talked about managed liabilities. If we go and look at, at these websites where they've got, you know, like banks that are advertising for large CDs and so forth, we can find those banks that are paying more than anybody else and just kind of track them and go, you know, like, oh, now, what's their loan por portfolio look like? What are their loan losses? And we can find out that some of those banks tend to be very risky. So anyway, this is a problem that we have with our uh, banking system. And uh, over time, you know, it's like, as I said, in the short run, we've solved our problem. But over time, we get more and more of these banks that are just, you know, and these banks get, these banks, these well-managed banks get smaller and smaller. And then these riskier banks get bigger and bigger. And so if we wait for 5, 10, 15 years, then we say, gosh, I, that's a problem we can't live with very well. Anyway. 
Now what happens? If this bank starts making bad loans and, make, and purchasing bad loans, loans that uh, are defaulted on, and then buying securities that are defaulted on, then its net worth starts going down. Now, this is not just this bank, any bank. But these tend to be the types of banks that are making loans where they have a high default rate and so forth. And their net worth goes down, down, down. Suppose that you, we look at a bank, and let's say it has something like this. Uh, initially, here's the deposits. I think I used uh, $65 and maybe $25 of borrowing and $10 from capital, capital borrowing deposits. Okay, and then it's got this $100 worth of assets, we'll say loans over here, assets. And now it starts experiencing loan losses due to high default rate. And we write these down, let's say $9. So now we've got $91 in assets. And then we turn back, and as you know, we still owe the depositors. We still owe the people we borrowed from. But when we not write off that $9, oh, minus 9, we've got $1 of capital. And by the way, they could have lost 10. But what's the situation now? Suppose you're at that bank. What would, would you think something like this? You know, we've just pretty much lost all, not quite, but almost all of the assets of our owners. To be fair, we've not done a good job. I'm asking you if you'd think this way. To be fair, we've not done a very good job. I should quit my job. Would you do that? Or would you say, just a second, I'm making a quarter of a million dollars a year, or I'm making a million dollars a year, or I'm making five million dollars a year. Quit my job, no way. What you would probably think is something like this. Boy, I bet the owners are mad. I need to do something good to get back into their good graces. What if I would do this? What if I'd make one big loan let's say a $25 loan, and there's a lot of risk with that loan. But boy, there's a high interest rate, 20% interest rate. Now, it's a lot of risk. But if I could get that 20% off of that, then that would make me so much profit. And the profits would allow me to do the retained earnings and to build my capital accounts back up. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. And so I guess what I'm saying to you here is, here's another type of a moral hazard that kicks in. It's not the moral hazard of the depositor, which we've already described, but now we have a situation where it is, hey, my, and uh, by the way, the owners, the shareholders will go along with this kind of a policy, because what they think is this, what have we got to lose? One, we've lost about everything. We don't have much to lose. If we go out and make this really big, risky loan or investment or a series of them, it doesn't have to be one, but if we make this really risky loan or investment and it pays off, hey, that is great. We're going to build our capital accounts back up and we're going to be good to go. And if we go out and make this some really risky loans and investments and charge a high interest rate and they default, then we're wiped out. Well, we don't have that much to lose. And if we're wiped out, and we only lose now one, then we just walk away and say, well, that didn't work out. And let's say, and we'll just use hypothetical numbers, let's say that we go out and make this big risky loan or investment, we might lose seven more dollars. Minus seven, oh, that's minus six. Who would bear that loss? And the answer is FDIC or taxpayers. FDIC in the first instance, but if the FDIC were to like be overextended, then it would fall on the taxpayers. So the first type of moral hazard we had was the depositors are not paying attention. And then what we have is a situation for those banks that get into financial difficulties and they've depleted most of their financial or most of their capital, then those banks say, hey, let's engage in a little moral hazard. I don't think they say that. We would say that. Hey, let's go out and take a lot of risk. If we take a lot of risk and it works, we're in good shape. And we take a lot of risk and it doesn't work, we didn't lose much. It falls on the FDIC. 
This is like a one-sided bet. We can win, but we can't lose much. Let's do it. And so that's what tends to happen is banks, when they start depleting their capital, the regulators are saying to them, you build your capital account back up. And they're saying, okay, 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 we'll build our capital account back up. And they'll do various things to build it up, but one thing that they tend to do is start taking riskier, even riskier loans, and I should say acquiring or making even riskier loans, acquiring even riskier securities than they were before. And you know, there's a reason those carry the high interest rates is there's a higher default risk, higher default rate, and a greater likelihood of experiencing more losses. The worst possible case is something that would happen like this. Let's say we get a bank and it's depleted all of its capital. Okay? Now, the rules, the way the book's written, textbook, regulatory books, and so forth, the way the rules say is this. If you deplete all your capital, you're out of business. Shut the doors. Do the regulators do that? And the answer is, not always. Sometimes what they say is this. You know, we don't, we've had a lot of bank failures already. We don't want to have too many more. This could trigger that loss of confidence and cause a panic. Can we maybe encourage these banks to do the right thing? And they'll go out there and do the right thing and then make some profits and build this back up and maybe get this back into positive territory. The term for this is called forbearance. To forbear is to basically put up with something. Okay, to put up with this negative capital situation. Okay, and by the way, it doesn't have to be negative to forbear. It could be that you say, oh, you must have a 10% capital asset ratio, and then it dips down to 2%, and forbearance would say that, well, we, the regulators, would just live with that. But what I'm saying to you is it, these rules aren't always applied in some hard and fast way. Sometimes forbearance is practiced by the regulators, and they go, okay. And then we let these banks go on, and what happens is there's more and more of these one-sided bets that are made, more and more of this moral hazard problem of, let's take a big risk, maybe it works out, and then we're all, you know, we make a profit. If it doesn't work out, we walk away, the FDIC cleans up the mess. Once this becomes negative, the capital accounts become negative, these are called zombie banks. You know, they're the walking dead. They're still alive, but they got nothing to lose. And these are the ones that take the absolute biggest risks. Anybody practically can walk in and go, I want a loan, I'm willing to pay 20% interest, and they go, have a seat. We can hook you up with some money. Okay, and these zombie banks are capable of losing massive amounts because they are rolling the dice. They have nothing to lose, only something to gain. And so then that's when we get the huge, huge losses. Okay. Anyway, we're sort of going down a path. We started off with moral hazard on the depositors. Moral hazard also exists when the capital accounts get depleted at a bank. And I don't mean to say all the way depleted, but the smaller they are, and it's a progressive thing, you start off with a 10% capital <coughs> to asset ratio, and then the owners are going, wow, every mistake I make, you know, that falls on me. And once this gets down to five and three and two and 1% capital and so forth, the less is there, the more you just say, I have very little to lose. Once it's zero, I have nothing to lose. And so now the moral hazard problem just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay? If this is negative, like negative 1%, it's kind of like driving a stolen car. You say, you know, and if you've never stolen a car, that's what I'm here for is to explain to you how this feels. It's like, hey, what do I have to lose? This is a stolen car. Not my insurance, not anything. If I run into something, well, okay, I'll get out and walk away. 
No, I've never stolen a car. Anyway, but that's kind of the idea. You're using somebody else's money that you're playing with. Anyway, so this is a problem that we have with FDIC insurance. What do we do about it? Well, how about this possibility? One is limit FDIC insurance. You know what a lot of people say is this, we need more FDIC insurance. We need to have 100,000, 200,000, 300,000, 500,000, whatever, coverage. Doesn't that make people behave more irresponsibly? So what if we just said, and by the way, back before it went to $100,000, there was $40,000 in coverage. And then a lot of economists said, that's it. And there was a movement underway in Congress. Who's promoting that? Banks. Which banks do you think want FDIC insurance coverage? Do you think really well-managed banks want that? Or do you think the banks that are like, yeah, you know, small, not so well-managed, and I don't mean to say those are synonymous, but if you're a smaller bank and you have a harder time persuading people that you're well-run, that, then FDIC would be good for you. Or if you simply have a risky bank that's not very well run, then FDIC will help you attract those dollars in. And so there is a lot of pressure on Congress. And many economists at that point are saying, you know, you're going to basically make these problems worse if you increase insurance coverage. And so then it went up to $100,000. Just shows how much people listen to economists. So what happened, uh, what was it, in 2009? Could have been 2008. I'm not exactly sure when that happened. But we were going through this financial crisis, financial panics, and some big banks were endangered, and a lot of people are going, oh, man, I don't know if I want to put my money in the bank. And what did we do? Well, to get through the moment, they increased this coverage, and they say it's temporary to $250,000 in any one account. And by the way, you can have multiple accounts that are covered. You can have, for example, let's say we have a husband and a wife. You can have an account in the husband's name, an account in the wife's name, account in the husband and wife's name. Then you could have uh, an IRA in the husband's name and an IRA in the wife's name. And I'm not sure exactly what other combinations you can do. I think you can have at least six a couple can have at least six different accounts that are covered. So, but the point is that every time there's a little bit of, oh, pressure, what are we going to do to make everything better? Well, we just increase coverage. Will this go back down to 100000 In theory, yes. Yes, sir. Is that just this account at one bank? At one bank. And go to another bank and another bank and another bank. That's right. And you know, you may not have IRAs, and you may not be married, so then there would be you, and then you're, well, if there's no IRA, that's it. So $250,000, and then 10 banks, $2.5 million. So anyway, but economists are saying, you know, this is going too far, because what we are doing, even though we get through the moment, we're making this situation worse where there's, let's pay even less attention to how well-managed these banks are. Let's funnel money out of well-managed banks into weaker banks. Let's let these weaker banks get bigger and bigger and bigger. They are weaker banks, so they are the ones most likely to make the risky loans, most likely to get into this situation where their capital is depleted, most likely to become zombie banks, and most likely then to just roll the dice and go, I don't care what happens. Let's make a loan and get 20% on it, and either it pays off or we'll just clear out and go do something else for a living, work elsewhere. Okay, so one thing you can do is put more of a burden on these people. And we talked before about, um, I think it was when I talked about Regulation Q, and I said that, you know, back in the old days, we made a distinction, and I also made a distinction in talking about savings de or time deposits between small and large. But Regulation Q used to say, hey, if you've got less than $100,000 on deposit, we'll treat you one way. You're a less sophisticated investor and so forth. You have fewer options available to you. And then if you have $100,000 and up, 
then you're a more sophisticated investor. So I guess what I'm saying to you is, if you are a more sophisticated investor, that's about time to say, you know, insurance coverage wasn't made for you. Everybody up to this some um, level of sophistication below that, then we're going to offer you insurance coverage. And if you are more sophisticated than that, then take care of your own needs. So anyway, that is one thing that economists would say. I don't know whether that's going to happen or not. I'm just saying that that is an approach. I'm not really here to tell you what's going to happen, but something that I think would be a wise move. A second thing to do is limit this forbearance. I was talking about forbearance where you say, oh gosh, these capital accounts are being depleted. Forbearance basically says, I'm warning you, but then, okay, you go ahead and I'll just give you one more month. And now I'm warning you and I'll just give you three more months and, and so forth. And just keep on issuing the warnings until all the capital's gone. Now it's a zombie bank and now they're just rolling the dice. I'm warning you. Well, don't do that. This forbearance leads to a lot of bad stuff. So is it one of the problems? It is a problem. Back in the, during the savings and loan crisis of the 1980s, S and L crisis, uh, 1980 what? Six to 1995. These are approximate dates. Forbearance was the order of the day. By the way. The government did a lot to create the savings and loan crisis. They didn't just do it on their own because they, oh, it says savings and loan, let's do something wrong. But what had happened to lead up to the savings and loan crisis is our regulators told, and the legislation, it told the savings and loans, make home loans that are long-term. Don't make short-term home loans. Don't make business loans. Make long-term home loans. And when you say make long-term loans, then what you say, what the regulation says is, take interest risk. They didn't say it that way. They said, take interest risk. Lend your money as long a term as you can. And that makes you vulnerable to an increase in interest rates. And then after these savings loans went out and made a whole bunch of long-term loans, then the Federal Reserve created inflation. And you remember our Fisher equation? When inflation enters the picture, interest rates go up. And so, savings loans are locked in, a lot of long-term loans paying 5% interest, and then we just start pushing interest rates up. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And I'm doing this because down goes the value of those portfolios. And so now savings loans are going, oh great, we've loaned our money out for 5%, 6%. That's our mortgages. And now we're paying 6, 7, 8, 9, 10% on deposits. Oh, that's great. Well, if you loan your money at 6 and you pay 10, you've got a negative net interest margin. And it's just a matter of time until you're wiped out. And so what happened was, through no fault of their own, they were following the rules and regulations. Through no fault of their own, their capital gets depleted. And then they become zombies or near zombies. I don't think we actually have the near zombie status in the movies. You either are a zombie or you're not. But in banking, you can be a near zombie. Like if you had a 1% capital asset ratio, you're just about a zombie. You've got a taste for blood. No, the, I'm sorry, that's a vampire. Uh, so, and by the way, are you all seeing these vampire movies that are coming out now? And so these near zombie institutions, the savings and loans, they started just rolling the dice. Savings and loan crisis ended up costing taxpayers $153 billion. And the reason it cost taxpayers $153 billion is because they burned through all of the insurance fund for savings and loans. That was gone. And then they had to turn back to taxpayers and say, we need some help. They, the regulators. And so taxpayers kicked down $153 billion. What kind of forbearance did they practice during that time? Different things. Like something will happen like this. Like you make a bad loan, and rather than just write it off, what they would say is this, we got a new accounting rule. We're going to let you write that bad loan off over a series of years. 
Let's say you own out 100,000 bucks and the borrower says, can't pay you back, rather than just say, minus $100,000, bad loan. We're gonna let you like only write off $10,000 each year over the next 10 years. And that way the capital is going away, but at a slow rate. This is make-believe stuff, okay? And they did uh, a series of other things. They basically would just be more generous in their interpretation, you know, like they'd come out to examine a bank and maybe there's something that normally we'd call this a bad loan, but we'd say, yeah, you know, it looks like it's still got a little bit of possibility there. Don't write it off yet next time. And the capital asset ratio. Maybe before we were saying you got to have 5%, well, we'll accept four, and then we'll accept three. One thing that happened was they basically granted capital to some of these institutions. They might get down to having almost no capital and then come along and say something like this Hey, you see this piece of paper? You hold on to this. And then the savings loan say, Well, what is that? And they say, That's capital. And then they would hold on to that paper and they say, gosh, we got a good capital asset ratio again. We got capital. The only thing is you got to give this back later. And so it's not real capital. It's this accounting make-believe kind of a situation. Okay. And so anyway, things like this happened. And we kept these zombie institutions in business for a long, long time. There was, uh, what was the one case? was uh, a savings and loan out in California. And they became a zombie and were really just on the edge. And so then somebody came along and said, hey, I want to borrow some money and build this really nice hotel in the desert. I think it was in Arizona. And we'll pay a lot of interest. And so then the savings and loan says, okay. And they start making loans to this, uh, this hotel company. And this really not, I mean, it was a palace. And that's the kind of stuff the zombie did. You know, this institution out in California, they were willing to take a risk. So anyway, what we need to do is, you know, tough love. We need to have tough love toward these depositors and just say, gosh, a little bit of insurance to protect the people who are, let's say, uninformed and naive, but not insurance protection for people who are very well off and also sophisticated enough financially that they can look out for their own interests. And tough love over here at these institutions. Once your capital is going downhill, we're going to give you a couple warnings, and then after we've given you the warnings, lower the boom. That's it. And if we are not willing to do that, then we are willing to get ourselves into a situation. I mean, that's what happens, is that we have these huge losses. Okay, um, there's another issue that comes along, and let me do a little bit of a race in here. The other problem that we have is, you ever seen these letters to get to before? TBTF, too big to fail. This is a financial institution. And so what we say, sometimes say is this, it's too big to fail. What does that mean, too big to fail? Well, I've already told the story about, what was it, 1930? Bank of United States. You get a big bank, big name, if it fails, of course there are losses there and there's sadness there and personal tragedy and so forth. But when this fails, then what happens is other banks around the country have depositors and those depositors were okay before, but now they start hearing this news. Then they say, gosh, could that happen to my bank? And then these totally innocent banks that are doing a, you know, the bankers doing a good job of managing uh, the institution and so forth, all of a sudden their customers, because of this failure over here, the customers start showing up and going, hey, I want my money back. Why? I don't know. I just don't feel safe anymore. Why not? Well, I heard this government bank over here fail. This is what they'll say. 
If that bank can fail, then I know your little bank can fail. I want my money back. And then that's how we get this idea of bank runs and so forth. Okay, so that's one possibility is it's too big to fail because if it fails, it is so big, it would attract so much attention and cause so much upset and concern that there could be a run on other banks. Okay, and we have this because of the underlying idea of fractional reserves. These other banks aren't holding 100% reserves. Okay, there's another reason it could be too big to fail. If we have a big institution, it may actually owe money to other banks and other companies around the United States. And so then if it shuts its doors and says, eh, hey, we're broke, then all the other banks that were counting on being paid, they're not going to be paid, or at least not in a timely way. And so then their financial safety may be threatened in that way. Maybe not a run, but, oh, we've lost some money, or we're not able to get money and liquidity in a timely way. And then once their customers hear about it, there will be a run. And it could be that they owe money not only to other banks, but just companies. Right? Let's say, for example, that, and we'll just pick an example. Let's say that General Motors transfers some money to a bank and says, hey, we owe $100 million for some steel we just purchased. We want you to pay, you know, like basically transfer this money. And boom, one second after this money is transferred by General Motors to the bank, the bank says, we're closed. We're done. Well, then that next payment doesn't get made to that steel manufacturer, that steel mill. They don't get paid. Now they're in trouble. What do they do? Well, you know, if you don't get $100 million you're owed, maybe you close your doors. Or maybe you don't pay somebody else. So you can be too big to fail. I'm saying in this, not too big to fail. Nobody's too big to fail if all we mean by fail is negative net worth. But too big to fail, too big to allow you to fail because either of the loss of confidence in other institutions or because of the money that is owed to other institutions and then it would cause these third-party effects down the road. We call this systemic risk. Up to now when we've talked about risk, we've been talking about the riskiness of a loan or the risk, uh, uh, riskiness of an asset to market conditions. And that is a risk that is confined to the loan or to the asset. This is a different, and by the way, this does not say systematic risk. It says systemic. The system is at risk. And so too big to fail is a term that we apply to some institution when we say, if we allowed this institution to fail, it would risk the safety and stability of the entire financial system. And so then if we had some, we've got banks today that are over a trillion dollars in assets. If we have a trillion dollar bank say, eh, we're done, then the fear is that people who had their money deposited in thousands of banks around the United States would go to those banks and say, give me my money right now. And the banker could say things like, oh, you know, we have a, a penalty for early withdrawal. And they say, I'll pay that penalty. Let me have my money right now. Okay, here you go. And then we start paying that money and it's happening all over the United States. Financial panic. Then what? Well, then recession. Okay. <coughs> Now, too big to fail is not just a term. It is a philosophy of our regulators. Our regulators say this. Hey, here are some institutions, let's say 10 of them. They're too big to fail. Too big to allow them to fail. We can't let them fail. They're putting those, the system at risk. So the regulators have this philosophy. The banks themselves don't. I mean, the banks get the idea from the regulators, but the regulators are the ones that start off this way. Too big to fail. Now, let's suppose that the government comes over to some bank and says, you are too big to fail. <coughs> then you say, oh, okay. And then you say to everybody, we're too big to fail. They won't let us fail. And now you look as safe as the government, right? 
the government won't let us fail. And if the government won't let us fail, then people all around the United States say, I won't put my money in that bank. Because if I give them my money, I can't lose. The government won't let them fail. So what I'm saying to you is that this philosophy of too big to fail, the reason for it is we want to save the system. But as soon as we do that, it's sort of like FDIC, you know, only a little bit different terminology, a different way we get there, but we're getting to the same place, is we are anointing some banks saying, depositors, if you give your money to these people, you can't lose. And so then people take their money out of other banks and put it in this too big to fail bank. And now they have an advantage. They're able to obtain deposits. They're able to obtain funds at a very low cost. And that makes them more profitable. And also, they may go out and say, hey, let's take some risks. Let's have a good time. Because if we take risks and it works out, we get the money. If we take the risks and it doesn't work out, we're still not going to fail. So we're undermining these other institutions, these ones that are not too big to fail. We're drawing money. I mean, we're reallocating resources out of the not too big to fail banks into the too big to fail banks and making our system, making the big institutions even bigger, small ones even smaller, and then creating a situation where this bank can be risky and people still keep on giving up money, even above the FDIC insurance number or levels. If it's too big to fail and it's not going to fail, and you say, yeah, there's only $100,000 of insurance coverage. I got a million dollars there, but I'm not going to lose. It's not going to fail. So isn't that wonderful? Now, what do we do about this? Can we get rid of too big to fail? Can we just go, okay, we'll let these huge institutions, trillion dollar, two trillion dollar institution, we'll just let it fail because we don't want to create moral hazard problems. We can't really do that. Because if there's a one or a two trillion dollar institution, it's ready to fail. And we just go, let her fail. That's what they deserve. Then the reason we call that systemic risk is the system's at risk. That's what happened leading up to the Great Depression. The system was at risk and the system failed. So we can't, due to systemic risk, we can't really get rid of too big to fail, can we? Not in any easy way. Here's what we could do, and some of these things have already been uh, uh, proposed. How about this? If you are anointed too big to fail, then there's special regulations for you. We will not let you take certain risks, risks that would possibly make you go broke. We just won't let you take those risks. Put limits on the kinds of assets you can hold on to. Okay? Oh, we can require you to hold more capital. Hey, everybody else is holding a 10% capital asset ratio for you 12%, for you 15%. So that would be an approach. Uh, one proposal has been to do this. If you're a too big to fail institution and you fail, it's going to cost a lot to, to fix that situation. You know, like we can still close these institutions down, but we have to do it in a very careful way. But the point is, one too big to fail institution failing, it could make the FDIC broke. So why don't we do this? If one of these institutions need to be closed, then we will just have a special fee on, or an assessment, on the other too big to fail institutions to solve this problem, rather than just going out to the thousands of banks in the United States and making them all pay more into FDIC. That's unfair because they have not had this special status. Okay? Something, and I haven't really seen this proposed, but it seems to me to be kind of obvious. I don't know if you've been watching the news or were in uh, 2008, 2009, some of these big institutions received huge capital injections by the government. These too big to fail institutions, here, take $50 billion. Okay. And so then these institutions had all this government money. And then the, the too big to fail institutions couldn't fail. They had all this government money and the promise of more if they needed it. And so, I don't know if you paid attention to the news, but here's where that led. After a while, the Congress started saying, hey, you know, they've got all this government money. They shouldn't be allowed to pay their top executives five, ten million dollars in salaries. And so then, laws started working their way through Congress, and there were even, there was a, a guy appointed to look over these institutions, these too big to fail institutions that received all this money, and to see if they were overpaid these executives, and to take some of that back. 
with a special law. And guess what? As soon as that movement was underway, and I don't mean to say, oh, we're not going to give you $50 billion, but policies targeted toward the salaries of a relative handful of executives. As soon as that started happening, those executives said, hey, let's pay our money back to government. Okay, oh, I'm going to go down from $20 million to $2 million. Pay the government back, quick. And so what I'm saying is those executives are, I don't want to say totally, let's say largely driven by self-interest. And as, as, so if we said you're a too big to fail institution, and so we have special rules on, or restrictions on salaries at those institutions, maybe some kind of a, it's called callback, where if you fail, then we're going to call back, we're going to make you pay back all these high salaries that you've received over the last three years. If something like that put their salaries at risk, they'd say, uh-oh, let's don't get in that situation. Okay, much of that, much of the problem that we had in that financial crisis of 2007, 8, 9 had to do with these too big to fail institutions. And the loss of confidence and the panic and the way it spread across the country. And so this is a major problem. I don't know what the solution is, but there are ways of dealing with it that we have never come to terms with yet. That's it for today. Next time we'll talk about the Federal Reserve. So long.